Hey, look, I'm sorry. It's the 13th episode. I had all these big plans. It was going to be like the Friday the 13th sort of the Halloween kickoff with all these cool DIY projects and scheduling and technical issues. Things got moved around and pushed out. Is anyone even still listening? But somebody is and they asked a question, so I wanted to answer it. It's about 3D printing and how you can make a, the right decision to get an affordable and easy to use 3D printer. We're going to talk about that today along with making your own custom high performance tiny whip frames. Let's hang in there. So you want a cheap 3D printer that can print TPU. Somebody asked that question in a comment on another video and I thought I'd just do a video reply. It makes more sense and it's easier to convey. So there's a few things about that question that concern me. One, 3D printing is like any other manufacturing technology that has its idiosyncrasies and limitations. Uh, and there's a few qualifiers in that question such as cheap and easy to use and TPU. Those are all three difficult things. It's kind of like this. 3D printing isn't easy. Um, for one, you have to have software and understand how to 3D model. And let's say that you already know how to do that and you're good to go and your software is capable of exporting as an STL. STL is a typical model format that most slicers want to use. And the slicer is basically it takes your 3D model and slices it into layers because that's what the 3D printers understand and that's how they print. And so the slicer that you use is the next challenge. There's some open source software that allow you to do that, but none of them are easy to use per se. I mean, when I first started 3D printing, it was a challenge to understand and grapple with all these different variables and you know this property versus that property and what does that mean and what is the limitation of the 3d printer that I'm using and what's the resolution how thick should I extrude how fast should I extrude what are, you know how much millimeters per second is the machine capable of extruding so the slicers get complex and there's lots of attributes and lots of properties and there's no real easy way to know unless somebody's already done the hard work for you and so if, when you get a cheap printer the chances are that it's maybe coming from China and it's inexpensive Expensive and it may not have all those attributes defined for you. So it's up to you to kind of start with some baseline parameters and figure that out. So when you talk about an easy to use printer, the only easy to use printers there are, are the more commercialized printers and those tend not to be as cheap, right? Or there are third party software that you can get like Simplify 3D is a great slicer, which gives you that polished experience where you bring in your models and you're able to set up templates. And a lot of cases, it's got a large community and the template may already be created for a particular printer so you can just reuse something somebody else has created and if not you can go to their forum and ask about it and they'll give you advice on you know how to set your machine up to work with that software so simplify 3d is a great tool to make that part of the process easier when you start talking about cheap printers then the, the way that they make those 3d printers cheap is by taking away features and so some of the features that make 3d printing easier like auto leveling beds or extruders that can handle tpu and just have better configurations this is a TAS 4. It didn't come with an auto leveling bed and uh, most cheap printers don't have auto leveling beds and so in which case you're responsible for making this thing perfectly flat this bed and there's adjustment screws in each four corners and before you print anything or if you clean your surface or you prep your surface you have to calibrate it and in order to do that that means you have to manually move the head around to different locations check the thickness check the gap and then adjust this accordingly and then move it check another location check the gap make sure that it's the same uh, and you do that in several points on your your bed to make sure that it's flat and hopefully nothing changes between when you calibrate it and when you print it and then you compensate for the machine accuracy by adjusting that bed so when it's perfectly flat when it's perfectly calibrated then your prints will stick well and everything will go good if it wasn't a good calibration then one side of your model will stick better than the other and it may come up mid print and then you can waste several hours on something that you could have prevented if you had auto bed leveling auto bed leveling works works in the sense that it automatically detects where the bed is and then programmatically compensates for any inconsistencies on the level of the bed. And so then as you're sending it the slice information, the machine is automatically compensating because it knows that there's a specific tilt on the bed. So if you pay a little bit more, you'll get a machine that has auto bed leveling. Like I said, this TAS 4 didn't have auto bed leveling, but I added it. 
have to upgrade the firmware, you have to upgrade this base fixture, you have to put this little servo on there that has the momentary switch that allows it to detect and read the position of the bed. And so that's not easy, but now it's got auto bed leveling and it's pretty functional. So lastly, TPU, flexible filament. If you wanna do that, you have to have like a weighed extruder, which is where it pulls the material down into the extruder. The alternative extruder that most 3D printers have are the Bowden extruders, and that's where it pushes the material. With TPU, it's a flexible filament, so if you're pushing the material, it's gonna expand and contract, and it, will, it won't have accurate control over the feed rate of the material going through the hot end. So in which case, that's a challenge. If you can find a cheap printer that has a weighed extruder, then your only challenge will be the software, how it gets sliced, how you maintain and calibrate the machine, and how ultimately you make the print. Hopefully I've helped you understand what the compromises are. All right, so let's break it all down. Let's simplify it and summarize it like this. With 3D printers, there's three different aspects you can have. You can use all types of filaments from flexible carbon fiber, nylon, ABS, PLA, hips, all these exotic type filaments. It can be easy or it can be cheap. The deal is here is you get two. You can get cheap and easy, but it's not gonna do exotic filament. If it's capable of doing exotic filaments and it's easy, not gonna be cheap. If it can do exotic filaments and it's cheap, it's not gonna be easy. You're probably gonna have to hack it. There's something that you're gonna have to do something to make it do these exotic filaments and to be cheap because cheap isn't gonna come like that. That's really the triangle you're working with. You get to pick any two, but you're gonna have to compensate for the other. That's the easiest way I can think of it. Yeah, you just can't have all three. Anyway, hopefully that helps. I'll put a link to a couple cheap uh, 3D printers that can do TPU and a couple exotic filaments, but I'm not sure that um, they'll be very easy to use. And then I'll put a, a link to the Taz Mini, which is, if you can't afford a, a full-size Taz, then the Taz Mini is the next best thing. It's fully capable, it's got a great community, the support is unparalleled, uh, and the device is just is gonna last forever. If you plan to do anything more than a couple prints, which of course you will, or else why are you buying one, then you definitely wanna invest up front and have the faith and confidence that you're gonna get your money out of it. At, at least that's how I sell my wife on it. So last week we took out the tiny whip, we put the B-Brain flight controller board on there and we did a little quick tuning. We were using the RKH aluminum carbon fiber frame, took it out in the backyard and you saw the video, it was a little underpowered. I believe I can fly, I believe I can touch the sky. <laughs> couldn't recover from the gravity after doing a flip and so it really defeats the purpose of having a powerful flight controller like the B-Brain. So we went back to the drawing board and I want to design some new frames, maybe shave off some weight in lieu of getting the insane motors which are apparently backward. If you have an extra pair I'd be happy to borrow them from you. So we're gonna open Fusion 360 up and we're gonna get in there and start to design a couple frames. We want them to be less than three grams because that's what the stock Industrix frame is and we'll see what we come up with. So we designed a couple frames, we printed them out, and these things are tiny. I mean, this one, for example, is less than two grams, which is minimal. It doesn't have any protection for the props, but if you're a good pilot, you don't really need them. And if you want more power, then this may be the trick for you. It's got a little mounts for the B-Brain, as well as um, the stock Inductrix board, as well as um, some mounts to put the motors in there. If you're going for the extreme performance edition of the frame. And then this comes in at around two and a half grams. This one has some ducting and protection for the fan but it's still lighter than the stock Inductrix frame. So these are just a couple different frames. We're gonna try them out. We'll go over to the workbench and assemble the Tiny Whoop with these frames and see what kind of performance we get. All right.
Alright, so in the time lapse you saw us run through the assembly of this frame. Um, we went out and flew it and it's got this very agile, very snappy. Um, so if you want the high performance, this is definitely the one that you want to check out. And also if you broke your stock inductrix frame, you got options. So you can use this frame, it works great. And I assembled both of these whoops with the new improved lightweight frame. It's almost as rigid as the carbon fiber aluminum frame, so it's worth checking out if you want a little extra power. The only thing that it doesn't protect is the bottom of the motors, but you can get little felt pads or something like that. So uh, just give you some options if you have a broken stock frame, just 3D print one. Word. Hey, so that's it. Uh, you know, we made a couple of high performance frames and we talked about 3D printing. Now we had a lot of other content we wanted to squeeze in here, but it's not going to make it, unfortunately. So this week, that's all we're going to cover. I'm sorry, man. We'll, we'll play catch up. We'll probably do two videos in the next week and just to make up for it. So in the meantime, mash on that like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Um, as always, be safe and have fun and I can't wait to see you next time. Let's go.